Hello and welcome back to the Sex and Healing Podcast. I am your hostess with the mostess, Erin Kiner, and thank you so much for joining me as we take a wild ride together through the realms of sex and healing. In today's episode, we will be diving into why sex, why create a podcast around sex and healing. So why? <laughs> oh my God, where to start? Why? It has taken me a long time actually to accept that this is what I might be here to teach and what I might be here to share. And in fact, I remember 20, nearly 20 years ago now being told, I think this is what you're here to do. I think you're here to help other women work through the sexual trauma that you've experienced. And I was like, nope, no way. Resist, 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 resist for 20 years. That's <laughs> in some ways typical Erin style. Uh, what I'm resisting is actually who I am. So I think from many healings that I've done where I've gone back and made contact with my inner child and my childlike self, I really have come to understand that even as a child, I had the sexual energy of a grown woman. I have a lot of energy as an individual. I have a huge spectrum that makes up who I am. And I don't think the world really knows how to handle feminine sexual energy very well. And that's the cause of many, 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 many things. Since the beginning of time, women's sexuality has been, uh, you know, mis misrepresented, misunderstood, shamed, shut down, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, we haven't been taught as a society really how to honor sexual energy, how to use it, what it's for, like we understand that it's for procreation, of course, but do we really understand its potential for healing, its potential for transformation, its potential for transcendence? I think people barely scratch the surface of sexuality. For the majority of human beings on the planet, they only scratch the surface of what sexuality could truly be. And for a long time, I've judged that as well, like, oh, you know, the church, the patriarchy, blah, 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 they've all shut us down. But there have been times when I have come in contact with this primal sexual energy inside of myself that is so freaking powerful and feels so uncontrolled that it's scary as fuck. And I can understand why that energy has been shut down in the past, because if tomorrow we went and activated the primal sexual energy in every single person on the planet, we would see fucking chaos. We would see absolute freaking destruction. <laughs> so I feel the same way about Kundalini energy, which we'll talk about more in the next episode about why healing. But I, it gave me some compassion, actually, for the way things are, the way that things are, the way, why, why things are the way that they are. <laughs> I couldn't get that one out. Ah. It gave me compassion and understanding for the church and it gave me compassion and understanding for the patriarchy. We are where we are. And things are changing on the planet now, which is amazing, especially in reference to sexuality. However, it just gave me that other piece of understanding, which allowed me to soften my resistance a little bit. So as a young person with a lot of sexual energy, I also experienced breaches against me as a child and experienced sexual abuse and violations of my boundaries. And I definitely carried a lot of that wounding for a lot of my life there has been times in my life where I've been completely shut down sexually and actually just thought that I was spiritual enough that you didn't need sex anymore. But actually that was far from the truth. It was very symptomatic of the things that I'd been through and symptomatic of different um, influencing factors in my life at that time. And now that I am, you know, coming to know myself more deeply and certainly over the last five years since my marriage ended. So I was in a same sex relationship from the age of 21 for 12 years. And for 10 of those we were married and gay marriage was not legal in Australia between the time that I got married and the time that that marriage ended. But in my heart and my mind, I was married. I didn't really care what the government said. I changed my last name legally that represented the fact that we were a unit. We were a family unit. Uh, and that marriage was as real and legitimate to me as any other marriage. It was a sign of our commitment to each other, a sign of the love that we shared for each other. And as that marriage started to dissolve and spirit started showing up in my life in a more um, 
what I thought at the time was a more profound way, but actually when I look back, I can see how much spirit has always guarded my life in many, many ways. And again, we're going to dive into what I mean when I talk about spirit and what that guidance might look like in future episodes. But certainly in the last five years since divorce, I have seen the way that spirit has been leading me on this journey to become more and more and more in touch with my true nature and discover who Aaron really is in the world. And that's something I also credit to my age. I'm 38 now, nearly 38 and a half. So I think that there is certainly a maturity that comes with being this age, a self-awareness that comes with being this age that I probably couldn't have accessed earlier. And when I think about my sexual awakening that's happening at this age, I also think it was something that I couldn't have done earlier. Um, as much as I would have loved to know this about myself much younger and could have navigated life very differently as an awakened sexual woman, I have no regrets for my life whatsoever, but I can see how much more empowered you become and how it just benefits your life in so many ways. And of course, I would want this for every woman and every man and whatever gender anyone identifies at very early in their life. But I also recognize that now is the time that I have that maturity and the wisdom to be able to handle this energy that is incredibly powerful and like all powerful forces on the planet can be used constructively or destructively. And we can very easily see the destructive nature of sexuality on our planet at this time. And we can see what happens with it the way that sexual energy is blocked and the way that it might be expressed in unhealthy or shadow kind of ways. <sighs> I'm sure we'll talk about this plenty, but I certainly don't want this to be a rant about <laughs> the way of the world as it is right now. All I care about is transformation. So it is what it is. And what do we need to do to move forward? How can we move forward? What is that all about? And that's what this podcast is about. So I would say about a year ago, my world started opening into the world of BDSM. So BDSM is an acronym. It's a bit of an umbrella term that covers many forms of sexuality, including bondage and discipline, dominance and submission and sadism and masochism. <laughs> so essentially these uh, sexual practices, I would say that involve elements of things that are considered kinky or considered taboo or considered dark. And they are distinctly different from what would be referred to as vanilla sex, which is what we would see in most mainstream societies is vanilla sex. So as BDSM started coming into my world, and honestly, it's been around forever. I remember being, how old was I then? I think I must've been 19. I was living in Brisbane. I was taking a lot of party drugs. My life was self-destructing. Absolutely. I was in a lot of pain. Um, I had absolutely no tools for dealing with that kind of emotional pain and the traumas that I'd been with, through as a child. And I found drugs and drugs were fucking awesome because they made me feel no pain. They made me feel on top of the world. And when you're in that much pain mentally and emotionally, then the drugs create this experience for you that is better than real life but what happens is you do the work on yourself and you do the healing and you make life really good the drugs become redundant and you don't want to do that to yourself anymore because your reality without drugs is so much better and the experience that i have now and the reason why i call myself mdma in human form <laughs> is because my connection to spirit is so strong that it makes me feel like i'm on drugs and i reach these absolutely euphoric states of being through my spiritual connection and through my sexual connection. I experience very, very transcendent states of consciousness through sexuality, which is amazing. So why would I ever put chemicals in my body ever again that make me feel like shit and give me a come down? You just wouldn't do it. But back then, that's all I knew. And I have a lot of compassion for that girl that was incredibly lost. But spirit was there as well, whispering in my ear saying, this is not you and these are not your people. But I had no idea what to do about that. So Anyway, at this time, I remember meeting people and particularly um, some people in the gay scene who were into dungeons and were into pain. And I never really understood it. And I had a lot of resistance to it. And in typical Erin style, <laughs> that which you're resisting is probably part of yourself that you don't want to accept. And so it has been sprinkled throughout my time. I've always been aware that it's there. But it was only about a year ago when it started becoming more prevalent in my life. And I would say that was due to a previous relationship that I had with a lover who 
our sexual experiences naturally held the power exchange elements of dominance and submission. And I think that it was the first time for him and the first time for me to really feel like we met someone who could match our energy and could complement our energy and held no judgment. And both he and I had previously had experiences where we've been told that there's something wrong with us or that those desires are disgusting or that people misunderstand or they don't like it themselves and and you feel terrible about yourself. So I think that it was dormant in both he and I as as part of our, our natural essence, I guess, but it was only in that context when we had each other in that way that it started to come forward and it came forward because it was perfectly complementary. His dominance started to come out and my submission started to come out. And even though I definitely had dreams about submission and, and the secret deep longing for it and confusion around it, it's definitely been there which is also interesting because I am a very alpha woman. I am a natural born leader. And even when I don't want to be a leader, <laughs> I end up being the leader because it tends to be that I can do it more efficiently than others. I can manage things more efficiently than others. I'm more confident than others. And so if me and my girlfriends here in Bali are trying to organize something and then nothing's really happening and I say to myself, Aaron, don't be the leader, don't be the leader. <laughs> Just, uh, and then I end up stepping up and becoming the leader. So it's interesting for someone that identifies as so strong and such an alpha and, you know, really that's such a big part of my personality, actually. How, how could I also be submissive? That's, I guess, where the confusion lay. And also in my mind, I had such an incredible judgment around submission being weak. And that in my times of being submissive in any way in my life, and particularly as a child, because children are naturally submissive. They're looking for leadership. The parent has to exert control. It's a power exchange. It's not an equal share of power. There's the parent and the child. And in those circumstances, I was really badly hurt. I was, it was not safe for me to be submissive. It was not safe for me not to have power and control. And so as a compensation for that, I became a very controlling person. So you couple the natural born leadership with that kind of trauma there's no way I'm going to be submissive. There's no way. And so what did I do? I judged it. <laughs> I resisted it. And actually it was just part of myself that I wasn't yet ready to explore. And so with that lover, I'm really, really grateful for his presence in my life. And in fact, I'd had a healing. I was uh, back in Melbourne a few years ago and I was with a friend who was also a healer. And I was recognizing this trigger inside of me from this guy that I'd been texting and this very insignificant thing happened and I felt very triggered over it. And I was like, okay, why that trigger? What is it in this situation? And I'm like, oh, I want his validation. So I explored that further and I was like, okay, when was the first time you remember feeling like that? And I remember being about 13 in, and in high school and I just moved high schools and I was getting relentlessly bullied by all the boys, all of them. They would just gang up in this pack and just follow me around and and just relentlessly taunt me. And I felt very isolated at the school, very misunderstood. I absolutely hated that experience. I fucking hated it actually. If I'm gonna be blatantly fucking honest with you, I hated that time of high school. So I remember these boys teasing me and being confused because on some level I could tell that it wasn't that they didn't like me I could tell that they liked me and I could tell that they wanted me to be the focus of their intention. I could tell it was me that they were following around all the time for some reason. It's just that it was coming out in this taunting, teasing, bullying kind of way. And so I remember feeling like this is this external experience doesn't match what I can pick up on. And now what I understand also is that I'm very psychic <laughs> and I'm very intuitive and I read energy all the time. And there's been so many times in my life where I'm like, this doesn't make sense because this is not what the energy says this person's lying or this like ah, that kind of um, discordance I guess between my inner knowing and my outer experience and again that just created so much self-doubt in myself back then so anyway I recognized that I had this need for validation and it wasn't being met and so I went back and facilitated an inner child healing for myself around my 13 year old self so I closed my eyes and I went to that place inside of me where I find my inner child and she wasn't there 
And I was so distressed in that moment because there's only one place I go inside of myself to meet myself. And if she's not there, where is she? And I remember saying to my friend at the time, like, she's not there. And then I noticed this little crack of light in that space. And I could see and instantly remember that I used to hide in the wardrobe of my bedroom. And I would get in there and slide my fingers underneath in the carpet and pull the door shut because that's the only place that I felt that I could get away from this life experience that I was hating. And still that door would be opened and I'd be yelled at and, you know, like pulled out of the wardrobe. And I'm sure there's a great joke in there about coming out of the closet somewhere. But right now we're not into jokes. We're telling this very profound story that happened to me. So I opened the door and saw my 13 year old self in there and she was just so angry. And she's like, I fucking hate this place. And I fucking hate this school. And I fucking hate, like, I just want to get out of here. And I said, yes, babe, we can, we can go anywhere. Where do you want to go? You tell me. And she said, I want to go to the stars. And I remember I used to lay in bed in fucking suburbia. Suburbia just killed my soul. And I would look out my bedroom window and look over the roofs at the houses and just look at the stars at nighttime and just pray I could be anywhere else on the planet except in my life and in my home and in my school. And so I said, let's do it. And so we went to the stars. And when I got there, all of my female friends, their spirits were standing around us energetically with their hearts so open they were naked but just beaming this light out of their hearts and I sat cross-legged opposite my 13 year old self and we were naked and I said I understand why you're confused because at that age I was like going into online chat rooms and having cyber sex with strangers and I was stealing porn and all of these sexual expressions that I felt so gross about like fundamentally felt disgusting, but also couldn't stop, was compulsively drawn towards this. I know that I was a very sexual person, but I had no outlets. And so I said to my 13 year old self, this is not your fault, babe. This is not your, makes me emotional, makes me want to cry right now. This is, no one has shown you what to do with this energy. What you're seeing is a very base chakra, low external expression of sexual energy. And you know, it feels wrong and you know that there can be more but no one's told you about it. So please do not judge yourself. This is not your fault, but let me show you now what our sexual energy is for. And I showed her as I sat cross-legged opposite her, how I could draw my sexual energy in and upwards through my body. And my Kundalini started to rise. And my friend that was with me, <laughs> hers was rising too. And we were laying there with our eyes rolling in her head, like, oh my God. And I kept pulling it up and I was really trying to force it up. And I felt it hit my heart. My heart got so warm and hot and all this energy was pouring out of me. And I just kept trying to push like, please, Erin, show her that you can do this. Like be the example of what it means to be in your own sexual power and that it's not for anyone else. But as I was pushing it up, it just, it wouldn't go any further. And then I heard the voice of spirit say, soften and open. The feminine doesn't push, the feminine opens. And so as I softened myself the energy started just to rise so gently god i'm covered in goosebumps as i retell this story it started coming up to my throat and i felt it hit my brain and my brain just gets so fucking hot on the inside and then i was like please 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 get this to my crown and it reached my crown and just started cascading over me in the most beautiful gentle waterfall of energy and there i am like that with my 13 year old also sharing that experience with us and it was just amazing and so profound. And then my friend said, can you imagine a man that could meet you in this space? <laughs> my first response was like, no. And then immediately it was like, boom, this masculine energy was right beside me and it had no face. It was just this like torso of the masculine. And he said, of course I can. And watch this. And he opened his crown chakra and he drew the cosmic energy downwards and I was like, oh my God. And I looked at my 13 year old self and I was like, let's do that. <laughs> and as I opened my crown chakra more, this energy dropped inside me almost like a kettlebell and it just like exploded. And this is what I would call making love with God. It was the most incredible, energetic, whole experience to understand that making love actually is not a, a substitute for having sex. It is generating the frequency of love on the planet through our connection. <sighs> so after that beautiful experience, the next day I was due to get my hair done and I was staying at a friend's house. I wasn't in Melbourne long because at this point I was fully nomadic and I found the closest hairdresser 
I called them. They said, oh, we've had a cancellation. Can you be here in 15 minutes? And I was like, sure. <laughs> so I wandered down to the hairdresser. I'm having a good old time with her. She's doing my hair. And she said, do you wish to put a toner in your hair? And I said, yeah, I usually go ash. And she said, oh, okay, do you want to try pearl? And I said, sure. Thinking pearl, it's just a shade of blonde, I guess. So she said, I'll put it on dry and it'll last longer. I was like, okay, still not paying all that much attention because I'm telling stories and I fucking love to tell stories, which is why we're here on the Sex and Healing Podcast. <laughs> so she took my hair to the base and washed it out and I came back to the mirror and holy fuck, my hair was pink. It was fucking pink. I don't know how I didn't notice. Actually, I do know how I didn't notice that she was painting hot pink product on my head because I knew that I was meant to have that experience because as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my God, I love it. And at that point I was 35 and I would have said, I'm too old for pink hair. I need to run my business. It's not professional. I never, ever would have asked for that, but spirit wanted me to have that. And I just got blinded temporarily focused on something else so that this experience could happen. And I know my inner 13 year old would have loved to express herself like this. I know that if I had the freedom to be myself at that age, I 100% would have colored my hair like this. So I felt like that was such a gift to receive as a recognition of that healing. And even the next day I went into a cafe and it was packed. And this woman yelled at me from the other side of the cafe and said, excuse me, I love your hair. <laughs> I was like, thanks. I didn't expect it. I went in for blonde hair. And she yelled back and said, it's a gift from universe. The universe wants you to have that. <laughs> so that was beautiful validation of what I know to be true. But what that pink hair experience did also was draw my next lover into my life. And so I put a selfie on Instagram that day and he had been in my life for a long time at this point, although we had never, ever shared any evidence of being attracted to each other in any kind of way. I never even given a second of consideration in that sense, but I had always admired who he was as a man. I really had put him on such a pedestal, absolutely a adore him he has a very developed feminine side a deep emotional heart a very loving guy but without the sacrifice of his masculine energy as well so I put that on Instagram and he wrote to me and that was the beginning of our two and a half year sexual relationship that opened the doors to BDSM for me he was the first one to give me the space and the ability to experience submission so I'm very very grateful for that but this was still a very private experience, something that I only shared with him. And I still had so much judgment and misunderstanding of the BDSM community. I had experienced a lot of violence in my life, domestic violence many times, and I couldn't understand why anyone would want to experience violence with their sexuality or why in a world where we have so much violence, would we want to consciously choose to partake in it? And I was living here in Bali. So let's fast forward maybe two years mm, yeah maybe two years since the blonde hair experience and I met someone who said that there was a kink community and obviously it's a very discreet thing in Bali because uh, even though Bali is Hindu we live in Indonesia which is ruled by a Muslim government and so there's restrictions around sexuality and when she told me that there was a community here I was definitely curious even though I still didn't understand what it was and I still had a lot of resistance to it. But I also couldn't not pay attention to it. I went back to Australia and then met someone at a wedding who is a big part of the kink and BDSM scene in New York. And she and I had a great chemistry and she then became the next person to lead me along the next step. And she started through our friendship and our connection, we would catch up on Zoom and have like three hour long dates. And she would take my mind into these places and ask me questions in a very, very consensual and, and a positive way. But my mind is trigger central when it comes to this stuff. Like I can't tell you how much mental shit I've had to work through to be able to reclaim this part of myself. So many layers of complexity and pain and trigger and trauma. So God bless all of these people who have led me anywhere along this path that have had the patience to stick by me, even if it's only been temporarily. And 
most of them were not capable of truly sticking by me, but the fact that they were there and that they took me to the next step was amazing. So I had an experience where she took my mind into a place that left me very triggered. I had then seen my other lover and we had had a beautiful experience and he had left the country. And then I felt very alone and dropped. These experiences would create this sense of high for me. And then both of them energetically disconnected from me at the same time. And I felt myself drop. And this is what in BDSM we might call a sub drop. So even though like one of them was a physical experience and one of one of them was only a mental experience that they both created this sense of connection and upliftment and these heightened states and then they were both gone and that morning when I woke up the next day I also was overwhelmed with a friend of mine who I had done some healing with who had lost her 21 year old daughter to suicide and often when I'm deeply connected to a friend or deeply connected to a client their energy that connection I'm still tapped into it even afterwards and so that morning all I could feel was her pain and I could see flashes of her having to identify her daughter's body and I could hear her crying and her wailing and her screaming and it was very very hard to to feel that pain along with my own and especially the fact that my own pain had been caused by what I would consider put under the category of BDSM which I was considering violent and that my friend's daughter had had lost her life in a very violent way as well. So my God, I was just so devastated. Like I couldn't stop crying myself. I got in the shower, I bawled my eyes out and I begged spirit to take this the pain away from me. Like help me hold this pain. It's too much. Help me move it. And so I go to the same cafe every single day for breakfast and I have for years. I love my morning routine. And this particular day, spirit kept saying, like I could just feel I had to go to the ocean. I had to go to the ocean and process my my emotion. And so Rather than do the same thing every day, I broke my routine for the first time. And as I'm driving down the street, in a split second, just as she was stepping into a restaurant, if I was a second later, I wouldn't have seen her. I saw my friend whose daughter died and I pulled over my bike and it was such divine timing that I was put there at that moment. And I walked inside and I called out her name and she turned around and she said, Erin, it's six weeks today. And I knew that and I just cried with her and I knew that that's why I was being asked to help her with her pain that day. That's why I could feel it. That's why I was so connected to those images and those sounds. And so I was able to give her a hug and then go to the ocean and I sat by the ocean and I cried and I was so angry at the universe and saying, why do you keep making me go this way? Like, why are you guiding me into this realm? I'm a fucking angel. I have come from the darkness. I have come through so much darkness in my life and now I live in the light and I do not want to go back. And I can't watch the news and I can't watch, like read a newspaper. I cannot expose, I can't watch scary movies. I can't watch anything or expose myself to anything too dark because it just gives me nightmares and it just, I can't do the work I'm here on the planet to do if this is happening, if I'm taken into the darkness. So I have to be so careful with my boundaries. So I'm saying, God, why are you making me do this? Like, I don't want to, I'm a fucking angel. Do not send me into the dark. And I just kept getting this message. You're exactly where you need to be. You're exactly where you need to be. You're exactly where you need to be. Excuse me. So I sat by the beach and I cried as many tears as I could cry until I felt that emotion release. And then I went to get home. I went out to my scooter and the guy, he was an Indonesian guy, was getting on his scooter right beside me. And so as we backed out together and kind of turned to start driving, I was directly behind him and I could see the back of his shirt and his shirt said, do not fear the dark, dark pleasure. And of course I roll my eyes and I'm angry <laughs> because God's still pushing me towards BDSM when I don't want to. And then in maybe the kilometer or the kilometer half journey home, one of these big green garbage truck drives past me and it has a sticker right across the windscreen that says angel in the dark. <laughs> so I resist. I have a little tantrum. I don't want to do that thing. But the way that spirit has shown up in my life, I trust spirit implicitly. And I can have the tantrum and I can pretend that I'm going to give up and I can pretend that I'm not going to do the thing which I know I'm being asked to do and which I know I'm being guided to do. But eventually I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to surrender and accept it. And so that's what I did. I would just take one step further and further and further. And each of those steps was so rife with trigger, had so much psychological work to deal with in order to kind of reclaim that part of myself and be at peace. And then I could take one more step 
and then I could take one more step and then I could take one more step. And so that's kind of led me to where I am now where I am in an incredibly loving and respectful power exchange relationship, which means that we hold the energy of dominance and submission. So my partner holds the dominant energy, I'm the submissive. And that is has created the most profound sexual awakening inside of me. And that is the reason we're here, essentially. <laughs> to sum up a very long but very good story, he is the reason why this awakening has happened. And if it wasn't him, maybe it would have been someone else. I just know the stars were aligned. I had done all that work on myself. I had overcome so much of myself to be ready to receive a relationship this profound and this loving and this respectful and this incredibly transformative. So, you know, inside of me always, I had had some sort of resistance to Tantra as a sexual practice. It just never felt like it was right for me. It never felt complete and Perhaps that's because what I do instinctively or naturally with my sexual energy might be quite tantric and that those things come naturally for me. But I always had this judgment of BDSM. Tantra almost seems light and spiritual, therefore good. And BDSM seemed dark and violent and wrong. And what I'm finding is that that is absolutely untrue, that through the darkness and through the exploration of kink and taboo and the reclamation of parts of myself, which I've been judging and resisting, I'm actually finding more power and more light and more love. So, you know, I had always been chasing the more subtle and more subtle and more refined experience as a psychic, as a intuitive, as a healer, as a meditation teacher, the more you refine your awareness of reality, the more that opens up to you. So, we become aware of these subtle energetic experiences that maybe you didn't notice before. And I always liken this to driving a car for the first time, someone else's car. So you get in and you're really heavy on the clutch and the accelerator, like you're, you're bunny hopping along the street trying to work out the, the clutch and the accelerator. But the more you drive that car, the more refined your awareness is and you're shifting gears more easily and you're braking smoothly. And then when that's really nice and smooth and you've refined your awareness of the subtleties of that car, then you might notice that the back window was down a little crack and it's whistling. And in fact, it was whistling the whole time that you were driving the car. You just weren't aware of it because you're aware of the gross and dense sensations of braking and accelerating and shifting gears. And so that's kind of like our life experience. Now you can be very aware of the dense vibration of reality. But as you start to refine your awareness more and more and more, and often that is removing yourself from dense vibration, you start to become aware of more and more subtle vibrations. And so another example of this is when I used to go to music festivals when I was young and like push myself up against the speaker and feel the bass moving through my whole fucking body. And I was so happy, but the intensity of the denseness, the grossness of that quality, that vibration means that you leave the music festival and you can't hear shit for a while someone was whispering beside you, you can't hear it anymore. By going into the density, you have restricted your awareness of the subtle. And the same, the opposite would happen is that you would go away into nature for a couple of days, or you'd go to a 10 day silent meditation retreat. And as you started to remove yourself from those dense experiences and start to go more and more and more subtle, all of a sudden you start hearing things that have always been there and you've had no idea. You can hear the most incredible sounds from nature and you can hear the communication of energy between things. And it's just amazing. So I've always been seeking that, like more refined, more refined, more refined. And then thinking, oh, BDSM, that old thing, that's just where they, you know, they go into the densest of densest vibrations, but you lose the whole other end of the spectrum. And that is completely untrue. That is certainly what some people do. And that's fine. And Maybe that's the life experience that they're here to have and maybe that's the capacity that they're here to experience. But what I'm experiencing is the most profound, spiritual, refined, energetic experiences through the density. So in fact, I am opening up the entire spectrum. I'm not just running into the light anymore and saying, don't take me to the dark. I just, I must live here. I must only do these things. I must, blah, blah, blah. it's like, I can have all of it and I can have all of it from that place of 
of love and trust and reverence. And there is no other person on the planet that will be able to do the things to me that my partner will. Because the amount of trust that it takes and the amount of love and the amount of respect and the the way that our minds and our hearts and our bodies must harmonize and entwine to be able to play with energy to that degree in a power exchange. There's very few people who could meet me like that. There's very few people experienced enough. There's very few people whose capacity is larger than mine. And of course, I don't want to be rule out the fact that other people might be able to do it in the future. And, you know, I, I don't want to attach myself to one person as the source of my experience. And I don't want to make fantasies and stories about the future that we have to be together or I'm not going to have this kind of sexuality anymore. I completely and implicitly trust spirit that if this relationship ends and should this relationship end, that this will not be the end for me and that life will continue to reward me with deeper and deeper and deeper experiences. But for now, I feel such immense gratitude to have finally found someone on the planet <laughs> who understands me and can work through my mind with me and is more powerful than me and is more of an alpha than me and is more intelligent than me and more successful than me and offers me so much space to be more. And in fact, he wants me to be more all the time. He calls more of me out. He wants to empower me in a way that many others have previously been threatened by or uncomfortable with or not known how to handle or not known what to do with that much energy. And finally, I've found a place. And so this sexual awakening that he and I are experiencing thanks to his wisdom and his his experience. And you're going to hear so much about him. <laughs> you're going to hear so much about us. You're going to like, this is going to be one wild, wild, wild ride that we're taking together. And I'm so excited for that because it's life-changing. It's profoundly life-changing. And I want everyone to know that that is a possibility and that sex can be like that. And whether that's how you wish to express your sexuality or not, it is irrelevant whether you understand it or not is irrelevant. All that matters is this is so right for me at this time. And I'm so grateful for all of those circumstances that got me ready for this and all the ways that spirit kept pushing me in this direction, even when I felt doubtful and afraid. So that is the premise of sexuality for me. It is an exploration into my sexuality. Uh, my, it is an exploration, of course, into my sexuality, but it is an exploration into my spirituality. It is a way that I get to reclaim who I am. It is a way that I get to heal profoundly from past experiences. It means that my mind and my consciousness opens up. It means that my heart deepens into love. It means that I can heal others through these gifts and these practices. And so sexuality has been the biggest vehicle for my growth in the last year. And I'm just so fucking grateful. And I was born for this. <laughs> I was born for this. I just was lost and hurt and confused for a long time, but I was being prepared until the stars aligned and here we are. So I'll be taking you on those journeys. We'll be exploring all different types of sexuality. Some of it will be triggering as fuck. Some of it will you will not want to listen to. Some of it you will absolutely reject. And some of it you will be so enticed by and curious about and explore yourself and all of that's okay. Whatever triggers you is yours and we will talk much, much deeper about triggers and how to navigate through triggers in, in coming episodes. But this is my experience and there is something for all of us to learn and to share. <laughs> and it's going to be a wild, wild ride. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for listening to my stories. I really invite you to share this podcast with someone that you think is going to benefit from it. Without doubt, as I reflect on my stories, someone pops into your mind, a friend, you know, someone that you've, a lover, someone that you've had past experiences with who would benefit from this information. And I always encourage sharing, always. So please. From the bottom of my heart, I would love you deeply. I love you deeply already anyway. What am I talking about? But I would be so deeply grateful to expand our community and to bring these messages to those who need to hear it because we're not all fortunate enough. Most of us on the planet at this time have never been shown how to use our sexuality in a way that's incredibly empowering, that's healing, that's 
transcendent, that's liberating. And that is what I want for myself. And that is what I want for you, my dear listener. So thank you so much. And I will see you in our next episode.